Good morning. It's 8.30 on Friday, May 20th. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, we ask a legal expert to break down Mississippi's abortion trigger law. Then, COVID-19 cases are on the rise in some parts of the country. Should we be worried? This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Mississippi is offering grants to help child care providers manage COVID-related expenses. But as MPB's Kobe Vance reports, advocates say they aren't getting much training on guidelines. The Mississippi Department of Human Services is offering the Child Care Strong Grant Program, which can help childhood care businesses recover from the pandemic. Funding is provided in part through the American Rescue Plan Act, and general department funds were added to maximize the pool of funding. Bob Anderson, executive director of DHS, said the deadline for the program is in September, and the agency will have one year to review all spending. We have a monitoring team that will be making an on-site visit to several of these child care providers. We'll be sampling about 10 percent of the providers who got these child care strong grants just to make sure that, you know, we haven't missed anything. Just as much as the providers want to be sure they don't misspend the money, we have to be able to assure the Office of Child Care, the federal authorities, that all these funds have been expended properly. Advocates say this deadline is restrictive for businesses, and all other states have deadlines to receive these grants that extend into 2023. Many child care providers have also expressed concerns about unanswered technical questions, says Latasha Headley, owner of Loving Hands Educational Resources. She says the information available on the DHS website is not sufficiently detailed, and the Zoom calls that have been conducted for training are not enough. I am afraid that at the end of this, they will not have time to correct what they've already done. And so we want to be proactive and get ahead of this where they can actually spend correctly on the front end, so that way once their monitoring visit comes, they will be able to do it without any um, issues. The DHS reports more than 1,100 businesses have been awarded the Child Care Strong grants in Mississippi. Kobe Vance, MPB News. Coming up, we ask a legal expert to break down Mississippi's abortion trigger law. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. If the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade this summer, almost all abortions will become illegal in Mississippi, potentially within weeks. That's because of the state's abortion trigger law, which was passed all the way back in 2007. It's carefully constructed to impose significant abortion restrictions if and when the high court undoes the federal right to the procedure. To better understand why the trigger ban exists, I spoke with a vet butler. She's a law professor at the University. University of Mississippi. The thinking is essentially that, you know, states like Mississippi essentially don't believe in having a right to abortion. um, And so they essentially want to be prepared to have a law that, you know, they say reflects their state's values take effect as soon as there's a change in the legal landscape. We're not the only state doing this, are we? No, we're not. There are um, there are several others around the nation, but primarily in the South. Lately, there's been a lot of discussion about abortion as it relates to rape and the life of the mother. Based upon the law that Mississippi has, as sent to the governor, it says that abortion could be done in the event Uh, that it was needed to preserve the mother's life or in the event of a rape that was reported to law enforcement? The uh, claims about not making abortion available at all, um, I think, is really more about making it effectively unavailable. Because a lot of people who seek abortion um, are seeking it for really just health care-related reasons, 
um, bodily autonomy reasons. And so by limiting it to preserving the mother's life or um, when it's caused by rape, that has to be reported, like formally reported to law enforcement. There are a lot of people who that doesn't apply to. What else stands out about this trigger law that people should be aware of? Yeah, so one of the things that the Supreme Court had recognized in Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey, um, the two cases that really are still on the books um, until there's no longer a draft opinion, Um, What those cases gave us was really the Supreme Court recognizing that not only do states have to have an exception for the life of the mother, but they also have to have an exception for the health of the pregnant person. So it wasn't just limited to life. It also included health. And so one thing that sticks out about this trigger law is that there are no there's no protection for the protection of the um, pregnant person's health is just limited to life and instances of rape that are formally recorded. What would be an example that would be in the realm of what you're talking about? Sure. So there are there are some health problems that pregnant people need to seek abortions for. So for example, some fetuses can have heart defects or neural defects that can cause death either at or shortly after birth. Some of those defects can also impact the health of the pregnant person. There can be things like kidney and organ damage that a pregnant person can suffer, usually at or after like the 20-week mark that may not result or may not guarantee to result in their death, um, but definitely have huge health implications. Um, And the way that the Mississippi trigger law reads, it's not clear that somebody like that would be protected at all. Some abortion rights activists have been talking about self-managed abortions. And in the trigger law, it does refer to the procedure or the use of prescriptions. So if someone was to use a prescription to have an abortion, would they be subject to any kind of criminal prosecution? So what's interesting is, um, and it it would be interesting to see how this plays out because there's often, there can sometimes be a disconnect in the way that a law is written and the way that it is actually enforced. Um, But the law mentions that um, a pregnant woman would not Uh, would not be subject to criminal penalties under this law. Um, And so it seems like it is more targeted at providers or, you know, doctors who write the prescriptions, things like that. So the provider could face one to 10 years in prison for performing an abortion or providing the prescription? Yes. What effect, if any, do you think this will have when you're dealing with the prescription, they don't have to get them in Mississippi. They can get them online. They can get them through the mail. Right. So I think there there are a lot of really interesting, big, unanswered constitutional questions here um, that I think really we're all about to find out what happens. Because, yeah, if somebody gets a prescription through the mail, Um, at least this trigger law doesn't indicate, you know, that that the criminal sanctions are limited to things that only happen inside the state. That's not to say that the legislature won't, you know, turn out a variety of bills addressing um, prescriptions from out of state. So there's a lot to speculate on what comes next here. Well, I have seen where some states have tried, well, are looking at legislation that will prevent a woman from going to another state to have an abortion. And I guess that would be the same thing in terms of trying to obtain a prescription. Is that even manageable? That's an excellent question. (laughs) So, and I think I would go back to what I was saying about there being a lot of unanswered constitutional questions here, because there are 
you know, like we have assorted protected liberties in travel, but there are, you know, we haven't, the Supreme Court has had limited opportunities to examine um, instances where, you know, one state essentially criminalizes the actions that happen in another state. Um, or tries to criminalize the movement of their citizens to another state to do something that's illegal in the first state. So I think one thing that we'll probably see that we're we're seeing happen and we'll probably see more of is states just passing laws to ban whatever they would like. (laughs) So sort of like this, like banning travel to another state and then figuring out the constitutionality later you know, because I think, like I said earlier, there's often, I think, a, there can be a disconnect between how a statute reads and how it's enforced. So, like, there will be really big enforcement questions, like, how do you actually stop somebody from going to another state? Or do you just wait and charge them when they get back? There are just a number of unanswered questions here. What this trigger law If Roe v. Wade is overturned, it says that the law would take effect after 10 days following the date of publication by the Attorney General of Mississippi um, in an administrative bulletin published by the Secretary of State. What does that mean? So essentially that is um, the legislature put in that language so that they could receive guidance, essentially legal guidance from the powers that be, (laughs) that this law can go into effect and is probably constitutional, and there would probably be no constitutional challenges against the law. Okay, but then after it's published, 10 days after it's published, then the trigger law would go into effect? Yeah, just as 10 days. Yeah, following that date of publication. I imagine it would be fairly quick, um, probably within a month, especially since, yeah, especially since this draft opinion leaked. You know, like I think now everybody's just kind of waiting to see how closely um, the final opinion tracks or um, differs from the leaked opinion. So, you know, since everybody sort of has this primer, I think it'll be a pretty fast turnaround. Professor Yvette Butler, thank you so much for providing your insight on this legal issue, giving us uh, a closer look, a better understanding of what's all involved in this. Yes, thank you for having me. Still ahead, COVID-19 cases are on the rise in some parts of the country. Should we be worried? This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. A contractor ever tell you the price of something and it sounds so high you think, eh, maybe I'll try it myself. Some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. COVID-19 case counts are ticking up in Mississippi and in the United States as a whole. Jamie Wagner is an infectious disease pharmacist at the University of Mississippi School of Pharmacy. She tells us her work gives her a unique perspective on the battle against the virus in the state. Everybody that gets hospitalized with any kind of infection, I get to go ahead and help optimize their management of their drugs that they're on. How have you found the drugs that have been used for COVID? They work fine. (laughs) Um, I think the monoclonal antibodies, so the infusions that we give to people to prevent them from coming to the hospital, actually do quite a good job at keeping people out of the hospital. But once they're past that point and then they come into the hospital, we do still use remdesivir. um, And so we try to, to do that. And it's, fairly good. It's better than not doing anything. Um, But it it just depends on what that virus does to that person. Um, And the drugs can only do so much, I think, sometimes. Well, we have seen a decline in cases over the past couple of months. 
and now we're starting to hear about an increase in cases. Tell us what you're seeing. I'm actually also seeing the same. So we're starting to see an increase in the number of patients hospitalized because of COVID. We're also seeing then that subsequent rise in deaths that come about two to three weeks after this rise um, and in cases start to occur. It just seems to be a little more frequently, um, not necessarily increased severity, but definitely increasing in frequency of the number of people um, catching the virus. Mississippi cases are up more than 200 percent over the last two weeks. Should we be concerned? I personally think so. I think from an infectious standpoint, you know, We've essentially around here, you know, you look around and hardly anybody is wearing masks. Everybody's walking inside, kind of going about their normal daily lives. And with the variant being as infectious as it is, that's not surprising to me that we've lowered all precautions and the cases are going up. And so I think in order to protect everyone, the best thing that we can do, Phil, is consider wearing a mask. You don't know what the person next to you is having to face either at home or themselves. Are they themselves immunocompromised? You don't know. Um, I think it's just trying to have general consideration for those around us. So consider wearing a mask indoors, not necessarily needing to stop what you're doing, but Be considerate if you haven't gotten vaccinated, even if you've gotten COVID, go get vaccinated. And hopefully that can help curb this rise in cases in our state. Are we talking about the Omicron variant being the one that's prominent now? Yes. So there's actually two types of Omicron variants. So we have the first one and the second one. And this 2A variant is the one that's starting to have that really sharp uptick. So it's even more infectious than the first Omicron variant. Have you found that the vaccines have been able to effectively keep people from having to be hospitalized? Yes, absolutely. Would you say that we're doing better in fighting COVID overall? I think we're doing better in coping overall. Um, I think that, you know, we've had enough or we've had a decent amount of people getting vaccinated. I think more still should. I think with the people wearing masks, that has helped. But with people now electing not to, that's probably why we're, again, seeing another surge. We do have medications that can help alleviate a lot of the symptoms once somebody catches it. But we're still not 100 percent at preventing people from catching it. And so I think it's more we've learned how to cope with it and deal with it, but not necessarily prevent it, um, if that makes sense. It does. For us, then, should we assume that this is going to be a way of life? You know, that's a great question. And I've seen some talk about that of have we shifted from a pandemic to now an endemic where This is going to be something like the flu, where we just expect it to be around forever. And I think as we continue to learn more information and as we continue to study this particular virus, um, that I think eventually we might be able to get it a little bit better under control, but it might be moving to a, this is how the world is going to be operating now, um, where this is the virus that's going to be coming and going um, throughout the, the full year and not just, you know, in the winter time like the flu does. And, you know, now there's talk about a monkeypox. I just saw that yesterday, yes. <laughs> so... Does that mean that potentially there's another virus coming down the pike? The monkeypox virus is very, very, very different. Um, So monkeypox is in the class of viruses that's related to chickenpox and shingles. Um, So it's kind of in that virus family. And so I think everybody's trying to figure out, okay, where did it come from? And it's called monkeypox for a reason. It's, It's transferred animals to humans. Um, And so trying to figure out what the source was. And so now because of, I think, COVID, we've gotten better at 
really trying to find the cause of when new things pop up. And we've known about monkeypox. It hasn't really been anything that people have had to be concerned about. Um, and so that's, I think, why this is garnering a lot of attention right now is because there are a lot of people that are this is showing up in. Um, and I think that's, that's why. Um, and so trying again to figure out where did it come from? How did that get spread to the people it got spread to? So we already know how it, how it transfers to others. Um, we already know its contagiousness on it. And so I think it's just a matter of figuring that out, making sure to quarantine those people. And I think we can get that under control rather quickly. Jamie Wagner is an infectious disease pharmacist at the University of Mississippi School of Pharmacy. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Stick around for a full morning of Mississippi Radio. Coming up at 9 is the Gestalt Gardener. At 10, it's Next Stop Mississippi. And at 11, don't miss Southern Remedy. Find past installments of this and other Think Radio shows online at mpbonline.org. I'm Desiree Frazier. Join us Monday at 830 for the next Mississippi edition only on MPB Think Radio. I hope you have a good weekend.